Hi, I'm going to talk today about the first two political parties in U.S. history, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists are later called the Jeffersonian Republicans, Democratic Republicans, and are now the Democrats of today. Well, the Federalist Party will eventually die off uh, after the War of 1812 with the Hartford Convention. They're seen as disloyal to the country and lose a lot of support, but their ideals still held strong. Uh, even though the party itself died off. And they later became the Whigs. When the Whigs die off, many of those Whigs uh, go on with uh, Free Soilers and some Northern Democrats to form the Republican Party in the 1850s. Uh, and that party still exists today. Well, the Federalists, they were led by people like Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and John Marshall, the famous Supreme Court Chief Justice. Uh, they were known for promoting industry. They were known for, uh, in order to promote this industry, they wanted a strong uh, national bank. They wanted uh, Great Britain as an ally. And they wanted to interpret the U.S. Constitution very, very loosely so that they could take the elastic clause, that, uh, the necessary and proper clause, to expand the powers of the government. There were four tariffs. Being for tariffs is another way to help industry. The idea is you tax foreign goods. So you tax imports to America. And that encourages Americans to go ahead and buy American goods, helping our industry grow. But at the same time, some people will still buy the foreign goods. And when they buy those foreign goods, uh, that will raise revenue for the federal government and help strengthen the federal government at the same time. Uh, the base of support for the Federalists happened to be in the Northeast where you did see most of the early industry in the country. Um, so the strong national government often made them seem almost aristocratic. In fact, the, the Jeffersonian uh, Republicans would oftentimes accuse them of uh, wanting to uh, transplant a new London, a new strong central government power, and that their national bank would favor the rich, dominate the country's economy in an unfair way. The Democratic Republicans, on the other hand, uh, they're led by people like Jefferson and Madison. Oftentimes I hear students say, well, isn't Madison a Federalist because he helped uh, author the U.S. Constitution and wanted it ratified, which is more of a Federalist thing. Remember, a lot of these, uh, not everyone in a party necessarily agrees with everything in the platform. As a president, Madison certainly agreed more with Jefferson uh, than the Federalist Party, someone like Hamilton. Uh, the Democratic Republicans, they want to promote agriculture. Uh, in fact, Jefferson envisions a country of small self-sufficient farms, or roughly as close to self-sufficient as possible. You know, every man his own boss, less exploitation. You know, you work in industry, you're working for a boss, you're not working for yourself. Jefferson envisions uh, almost like a utopia where every man is the boss of himself. And we could be the breadbasket of the world. We don't need the manufacturing. We don't need the industry. Europe will always be making those things and will always want uh, stuff coming off our farms, whether it be tobacco or other products later on, especially, you know, uh, a little bit more after Jefferson's time, cotton with Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. Uh, Democratic Republicans, they fear that strong central government that we had fought against London, you know, Parliament, all the power there. And so they want as much local power as possible. That's why they favor state power, state governments, and they want a weak uh, central government. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, after Shays' Rebellion, uh, had made many question whether the Articles of Confederation were too weak. Jefferson said, you know, we don't want to overreact. You know, uh, we can put up we can put up with these little rebellions. In fact, we should encourage and welcome them. Uh, the only mistake with Shays' Rebellion is how we handle it by strengthening the, strengthening the national government too much. So they favor these strong state governments. And so that makes them interpret the Constitution very, very strictly when it does, in fact, pass. Because the strict interpretation of the Constitution will inhibit 
will uh, stop the elastic clause from expanding the federal government's powers too much. And keep in mind, when we say federal government, uh, some other synonyms for federal government are national government, central government. We're talking about the government that's currently located in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Democratic Republicans, they wanted to favor France. In fact, uh, remember, France helped us win the American Revolution. After the Battle of Saratoga, France starts helping America, uh, assisting us in the American Revolution. Without their vital assistance, we probably would have lost the American Revolution. And likewise, uh, the French, they have their own revolution shortly after the American Revolution, in large part because they rack up a lot of debt helping fund our American Revolution. And the French took to a lot of our ideals uh, during this American Revolution uh, time period. Uh, the Democratic Republicans are against tariffs. Now, we already talked previously why the Federalists would be for tariffs. So why would somebody be against tariffs? Now, keep in mind, the Democratic Republicans, they represent a lot of farmers, a lot of the small people. In fact, that's who they say their target is. You know, we represent the little guy. And a lot of people want to uh, be able to buy products cheaply, and sometimes that means buying foreign products cheaply. So tariffs raise the cost of goods because it puts a tax on those foreign imported goods. So they oppose that. Remember, they don't want to help the industry. Remember, they envision uh, agrarian society. You know, every man his own boss, less manufacturing. Um, likewise, uh, their base of support, therefore, is more in the south and more in the west. Of course, there's many, many farmers in the north. But uh, most of the industries in the Northeast, that's why the Federalists are strong supporters uh, there. And likewise, we see the Anti-Federalists, the Jeffersonian Republicans, the Democratic Republicans. That's why we see them down South and a little bit out West, favoring these strong state governments. And they're oftentimes seen as the masses. And that's not necessarily a compliment. Remember, the Federalists uh, oftentimes criticized uh, the Democratic Republicans saying that they're for the masses. There was a strong fear that the average person out in American society at this time was uneducated. Remember, we information wasn't disseminated quickly either. And there was a strong fear that most people were out of the loop, not well educated, and prone to extremes, prone to riots, especially after the French Revolution. And so being seen as for the masses the Federalists, actually, that was a fairly uh, effective critique oftentimes. You know, they're the masses. They're the riots. They're what you see going on over in France during the French Revolution. Uh, and, of course, they're against the National Bank. People like Jefferson see the National Bank as favoring the elite. Uh, not necessary. Something that the state governments could be doing. Uh something that exploits the little guy because they don't have these same opportunities and it gives more and more power to the big um, elites in society. You see other people uh, have the same idea from the same party later on. For example, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, of course, uh, vetoes the rechartering of the Second National Bank. Uh, the Federalists, I had said before, have um, eventually turn into the Whigs after a while, after they die off, after the Hartford Convention and the War of 1812. You can see a lot of the old Federalist ideas in the Whigs. You know, they support the National Bank. It's Henry Clay bringing back that, trying to bring back that uh, uh, bank to, to renew that second U.S. National Bank. It's Henry Clay supporting tariffs. It's Henry Clay uh, with his American system supporting the the U.S. National Bank supporting high tariffs, and then he's going to take this money and have the federal government build internal improvements, roads, bridges, canals. And the Democrats at the same time opposing a lot of that, vetoing a lot of that, saying, well, that's the state's prerogative, that's what states should be doing, not the national government. And that the national government, by getting involved, is picking certain regions over other regions, and, uh, and that shouldn't be the case. Uh, Likewise, you see this whole Democrat uh, uh, party continue on with a lot of these, uh, the, the anti-national bank for many, many years. 
being against tariffs for many, many years. Uh, you even see uh, into the late 1800s and early 1900s some of the Republicans supporting higher tariffs, having that strong base in the North and Northeast, supporting uh, the industrial interests of the country. And so that's a review of the uh, early political parties. Hey, Dayton, come here. Do you want to see? Oh, you coming up? Can you say hi?